Hello everyone, uh, my name is Camden Gallagher, going to be going over the Iroquois Theater Fire with you guys today. Um, first things first, just want to give a shout out to the rest of my group, uh, Mitchell, Austin, Reese, and Michelle. Um, they all put a lot of work in on this, um, and although you might just be hearing my voice, just want to let you guys know they also put in a lot of work and uh, couldn't have done it without them. Uh, so just to start off, I'm going to give you guys some background on the event. Uh, this was 1903 in Chicago, Illinois. On a Wednesday afternoon in late December, um, this was for the Mr. Bluebeard uh, musical, popular musical at the time, uh, was performed in a very packed house. Uh, just for kind of a location reference, the Iroquois Theater was located where the James M. Nederlander Theater is uh, today. I'm not going into the event that happened. Um, so started off, uh, arc lights were used to create kind of a moonlight a look on stage as you can see here to the left is one of those um, doesn't look all that sound kind of looks like a little sketchy of structure um, but anyways during the play one uh, one started to spark due to a possible uh, short circuit and one of these sparks landed on a stage curtain caught fire and quickly spread to a highly flam flammable painted scenery as you can imagine the stage made out of a lot of wood as well so that helped uh, kind of spread the fire quickly. Um, once the fire began to spread, people started to notice it. Audience began to panic and tried to flee the building. Uh, they were met with bascule locks that they didn't know how to open. Uh, these locks are just kind of like multi-step type of things that obviously in a panic, you're not going to be you know, thinking straight and fast. Um, so this kind of barred them from getting out. Also, the emergency exits were not very obvious. Uh, Quite the opposite, um, they're kind of covered in drapes and stuff, not very, you know, standing out like today's exits where they're super bright, you know, you see a nice big bright exit sign. These ones were more of covered. Um, but the few audience members who did manage to get to the uh, fire escapes, they found them to be unfinished, um, had to leap pretty much off of them onto the icy ground far below. Um, so they aren't, they obviously weren't safe and complete anyways. So even if some of them did find the emergency exit, wasn't even the best exit at the time. Um, so here we got some pictures, uh, one from a newspaper clipping and also from the inside of the theater. The issue that the theater had was there was no fire alarms um, or even a telephone. So as the fire began to spread, uh, no one had, the fire department had no clue that this was happening. Um, someone from the theater actually had to run to the nearest fire department to pass the news. As you can imagine, this is definitely not the fastest way for information to travel, um, but it was kind of, it was the only option that they had uh, at the time. On top of no fire alarms being inside of the building, uh, the theater itself was just a disaster waiting to happen. Um, construction fell behind in fall, uh, which made them rush for their grand opening date of November 23rd. Um, so many of the inspectors were paid off and corners were cut, especially in regards to fire preparedness, uh, fireproofing construction for the majority of the theater. Uh, theater stage and arch was made out of wood. Like I said earlier, uh, the wood catching fire, spreading the fire faster, just made conditions uh, just completely worse. The theater doors also were designed to open inwardly. Um, as you can imagine, a whole bunch of people packed up against doors that are supposed to open towards them. They're obviously not going to be opening. The structure of the building just really was not in favor of people escaping during an emergency. I'm continuing on with some of the structural uh, mishaps. Ventilation uh, was incomplete on the side of the stage. Um, so once the stage's back doors were opened by performers and stuff, um, all that air rushed in and headed towards the gallery and the balconies and everything where all the people were at, um, just causing all the smoke and fire pretty much to just push that way, uh, which obviously is going to lead to more deaths. Um, as you can see here by this drawing, so the stage here, we got one ventilation up here that wasn't complete. Um, this is just going to lead all the air in this way up towards you know the gallery and the balconies, causing all these people to get suffocated from smoke. Um, the heat obviously is going to increase as the fire begins to spread um, and just really was not in their favor. So here's a picture of the theater before the fire. And here's some pictures from after, as you can see, all these chairs down here appear to be melted and stuff. Um, can't imagine the intense heat. Everything just looks charred. Uh, continued from the right-hand side now. Um, everything is just torched. So after the fact, uh, this was 
marked as the fifth deadliest fire in U.S. history. Uh, 1,700 people were in the theater at the time of when the fire started, um, leading to 602 fatalities. So trying to look at the glass half full here, shortly after the disaster, all the theaters in the area were shut down for inspection and repairs. Obviously, after 602 people get killed in an in a incident like this, um, big change is going to be needed. And I'm glad that you know people stepped up uh, to make these changes. This incident also caught national media's attention and it led to other cities around the U.S. to do the same things. Chicago City Council passed a new building ordinance by an overwhelming majority that compelled uh, structural changes, including some new standards for aisles and exits, use of fireproofing solution on scenery. As I said earlier, uh, some of the scenery on stage helped spread the fire, connected fire alarms, limits on occupancy, and changes to sprinkler requirements. Uh, the Iroquois fire also inspired the development of panic bars. I know we've all seen these in restaurants, in large buildings, uh, doors with a whole bunch of red stickers on them. We all are scared to touch them. Um, it also led to outward opening doors that remain unlocked and exit lights. Uh, you know, exit lights make a huge difference, helps calm down a panic situation, um, and is a little bit easier to figure out where to go in case of an emergency. Now, there were so many victims in the Iroquois fire, um, so we can't memorialize all of them here. We'll include a couple of their stories. Uh, Alfred John Oakley, born in 1863, was a dentist, married with four children. Uh, he attempted the musical that day with two of his daughters. All three of them perished. Uh, 32-year-old Lucy Wolfgarn was born in 1868. She took her youngest sister, uh, her two children, and a seamstress. All five were killed at the incident that day. Rose Rogers, who was a 32-year-old school teacher. Um, also died in the tragedy, as you can see here in this uh, newspaper clipping, kind of explains what happened to her um, on that day and why the exits were so bad. Um, in conclusion, it's a shame that massive tragedies like these ones do occur uh, before changes are made. Um, as throughout history, it seems like we need to be taught so many lessons before they actually stick and we actually make change. Um, over 100 years later, Maximum occupancy rules are ignored, sprinkler systems aren't installed, etc. And it usually has to do with financial gain. Um, so many issues when it comes to fire safety are to, you know, limit spendings on buildings, um, try and make them less expensive. But I think making these shortcuts on fire safety can be very, very dangerous and very bad decisions. But our fire departments today are working tirelessly to save lives and try and make these rules stick and are really pushing these things. Um, so hopefully going forward, we can make a difference as fire prevention students and professionals. Thank you guys for listening.